I had no idea this morning we were going to hear a testimony like that. Um, and so you just sit there and you go, what, what am I, what do you, what do you say? What do you, this is, this is, uh, none of us have experienced anything like that. I, I, I don't even know how to process it. You, you just, you, you know, you ever, you ever go somewhere as a missionary and, and you get there and you're just so humbled because you thought you were going to teach them something. And then you look at their lives and you feel about this big. And, and, and you, you just, you just go, I, I don't even know how to talk right now. I've, I've done that. I've been in Africa. I've been in India where I just go, I don't know what to say. I, I really don't. I honestly, I'm not trying to be humble. I'm just, I'm just floored right now. And you look at your life and uh, the, for, for some reason people lift you up for different things. Then you, you see something so authentic, so real, so clearly of the Lord. And you just go, man, I just want to soak that in for a second. And so it's, it's, forgive me if I'm a little out of sorts right now. Um, and I was already messed up. Um, no, because I, I, I woke up this morning early um, because I just sensed the Lord wanted me to go a different direction and there were some things that he wanted me to say today. Um, I, I, I believe the Lord, I, I mean, this could be him. I, I could be just because of some conversations I had with some of you yesterday that got me thinking But I believe the Lord wanted me to start off this morning with some confession of sin publicly. And so I'm just going to go with it and and, and see how it goes. Um, And I believe it ties in perfectly with the passage in John chapter 15. Um, and, and, and it is motive. I, I, I talked to a couple of friends of mine that I hadn't seen in like 25 years. We went to seminary together and one of them made the comment that, uh, he felt like he was just now recovering, um, from seminary and, uh, and he was saying, gosh, it seems like you're a little further along in that process. I go, I know, isn't that crazy? 25 years and I still have issues from that time. And I don't know if anyone just publicly talks about this stuff, but I'm going to. Um, because I, I, I've lied about some things over the years. And my lies, the Lord opened my eyes to some of the deception reminded me of some of the deception and showed that I sinned against him. It's been hurting my life and it has also kept others from benefiting from truth because of some of the lies in my life. And I have lied for the sake of reputation. That's usually why we lie. Um, is you want to look good. You, do, you don't want people to know the truth. Um, and, and as leaders, we can hide more easily than most people. I, I, a passage that comes to my mind is Revelation chapter 3, when Jesus is speaking to the church in Sardis, and he says, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. He says to this church, okay, everyone knows about the church in Sardis. Oh, you're so alive. But God himself says, but I know who you really are and you're dead. And I think of that passage when I think about us as leaders. Because we all have a reputation. You just do. The moment you took the position, you took a reputation. People assumed when you took that title that you were a godly man. They just assume that. Your congregation assumes you have this great walk with the Lord. You have a reputation. And who's going to call you out on it? Who's actually going to come into your life? Who in your congregation would really come in in love and just question you on your walk with God? That's why some of you in this room are in affairs right now. But no one calls you out on it. No one, no one dares question you because you are pastor. Some of you are addicted to pornography. You hide it, but who's going to call you out? Because you're pastor, you're reverend, you're the leader, you're the shepherd. You have a reputation of being alive. Some of you have not had a sincere, just like heart-to-heart, intimate time with the Lord in so long. But who's going to bring it up? 
You've got a reputation. Man, I've got a reputation. Who's going to question me on my walk with the Lord? I wrote crazy love. Okay? Of course I'm in love with Jesus, right? Of course I have these amazing intimate times with the Lord. And we just assume certain things because you have a reputation of being alive. And that's why I love that passage because God says, look, I don't care what everyone thinks about you and everyone assumes about you. I know the truth about you. And that passage is always one of the ones that's on the forefront of my mind. Going, you know what, Lord, I'm I'm here to please you. And yet, even so, I... uh, I, I fall into this trap of deception sometimes. And some of you, okay, some of you, especially at this conference, this conference specifically, okay, this is the Oxygen Conference. And this one is going to be a little bit more scholarly than most. And it's going to attract people that may be a little bit more scholarly than most. And, and you've got a higher IQ than, than, than a lot of people. And when you're scholarly, people don't want to approach you. They're intimidated by you. Because I could be totally wrong. I could be totally right about something. But if I argue with you, you'll still win. Right? I mean, it's like the little guy going to the gym and all these guys are just ripped and you're just going, "Ah." I I can't argue with any of them. They'll just beat me up. It doesn't matter if I'm right. They're bigger than me. And so many people will look to you with that mindset. doesn't matter where your relationship with God is because you're, and that's not your fault. I'm not saying, yeah, why would you be so smart? God made you that way. That's wonderful. That's a great gift. I'm just telling you, it makes you less approachable by the common person who doesn't want to dare question you because he knows you could put them in their place. And you know it too. And so we can have a reputation and very few people will call us on it. Here are some of my confessions. The first one is just an admission. I don't think it's a sin. Um, I'll get into my sin later. Uh, I'm really bad at comprehending things. I have poor comprehension. I don't know what you call that. But I I always have, you know, in in seventh grade, you know, you're reading these books and, and the teacher says, what did that mean to you? And all these people will explain what it meant. And I'm going, wow, I didn't get that. I just thought about it. It was about a guy that fell off a cliff and flies flew around his head. I I don't know. I don't get it. I I, I try to comprehend things and I don't get them. Now, I knew how to take tests. I knew how to study. I knew how to get A's. I was an A student in seminary. I even calculated in my head what it would take to graduate with one of those uh, those golden sash things. Um, because I remember going to graduations and seeing the guys that didn't have them. And I thought, what losers, you know, I am going to get one of those golden sashes. I will be some sort of cum laude. And, uh, I calculated it all out and figured out exactly what I needed to, to, to get one of those. And I, and I knew I could do it. Um, I ended up missing it, like barely, which was so lame. And it was because of my preaching class. It was not even fair. Okay, it was so not fair. Uh, Because, okay, I I preached this one sermon, I got an A on it. So my next one, and it wasn't that great of a sermon. And I thought, wow, I got an A on that. You know, so my next one, I I figured out how to get A in the class. I just figured I'll just do it a little bit better. And of course I'll get A. So I preached a better sermon the next time. And he gave me a C. And I remember going to the professor, I'm going, whoa, 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 wait a second. I said, how did I get a C on that? I go, was this one not better than my last one? And he goes, yeah, it was actually. And I go, I exposed it. I, got, I went deeper into the Greek, deeper into the Hebrew. I, I did this. I, I had the prepositional statement like you told me to. I did these things, you know, stuff that you're never really going to use. But I did it all. I go, how did I get a C? And he goes, Ah, yeah, I don't know. I, I, yeah. I, I go, well, do you realize that you are going to keep... I told him this specific. You're going to keep me from getting one of those golden sashes. You're going to keep me from graduating with honors. Just because this one grade, I calculated this whole thing out. And he didn't change it. Um, 
I'm still bitter. Uh, I was one of the losers. Um, Okay, so I, 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 I don't have great retention on certain things. I know how to pass a test. I know how to get a good grade, but I don't really understand what I'm studying most of the time. And I don't remember it later. I'll remember random things, but I can try to remember stuff, and I just can't. Um, so that's just who I am. Where the sin comes in is I don't admit that. I've never publicly just admitted that. I fake it, and I pretend I understand things. I've always done this, always done this. I just kind of nod my head because I don't want to be that person that doesn't get it, that slows down the class, and I just go, man, I don't even belong in this room. Um, When I don't understand something in my pride, I don't admit it, and I don't ask questions. I remember my very first seminary class very first statement out of the professor's mouth a guy named dr mueller came out and he had one he had an english accent and he got up and he says we will start with some prolegomena (laughs) wow and he goes for those who don't know what that means it just means introduction why did you say that? And he, he, but he went on. I still remember because he said some things where he made this comment about some uh, principle. He goes, there's this principle, da, 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 da. He goes, which we all learned in bonehead physics. And I'm sitting there going... I never took physics. I don't know what he's talking about, but I'm not going to raise my hand and go, hey, I didn't take physics. And everyone look at me like, wow, you're Chinese. You didn't take physics. I'm not going to do that. So what am I going to do? I'm going to just laugh with the rest of the class. Oh, yeah, bonehead physics. Oh, I remember that. I remember preaching at our, our, a past, our, at our conference for my alma mater, my, my Bible college, and, and uh, having dinner with the president and uh, a, guy, a guy named John MacArthur, Dr. John MacArthur, and, uh, and he had another speaker. It was John MacArthur, another guy named Al Moeller. It's pretty smart. Um, and me. <laughs> and, uh, and we're having dinner, and my wife's with me, and everything else. And they were talking about stuff at the dinner table. Man, I was concentrating, I promise you. I was listening so hard, had no clue what they were discussing. I mean, they were using these words that were just insane. And I'm just listening and eating, going, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, just nodding my head. And then, oh, that awful question came up. What do you think about this, Francis? And what do I do? What would a humble person do? Say, I I, I don't know what you're talking about. What does Francis do? I just kind of go, yeah, man. I go, that is such a hard one. I could go either way. (laughs) I I need to revisit this sometime and uh, refresh my memory on whatever you're talking about. You know, it just... I'm not, I, that, that's me, that's so dumb, that's so proud, my, my wife, thank God for my wife, who is so not that way, just kind of goes, she goes, I don't even know what you guys are talking about, and so, you know, Al explains it to my wife, and I'm looking at her like, we've talked about this, <laughs> stupid, stupid, Man, <laughs> that's me, you know? And you're going, oh, Francis, that's good. You're, you're confessing these sins of the past. It's not the past, okay? Now, three years ago, three years ago, I get a phone call from this guy I don't know named Don Carson. And he asked me to speak at this thing called the Gospel Coalition. I don't know anything about this stuff. 
And he's asking me to, to lecture like the, the, this, this circle of scholars in the gospel coalition. And I'm just writing down all the notes on the phone, pretending I know what he's talking about. I'm like, oh, that's a good topic. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, let, me, let me think about it. And I run over to my Bible college. Believe it or not, I started a Bible college. And, uh, you know, hired all these guys that knew more than me. And I admitted to some of them. Look, I, 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 this is over my head. And I went to one of the guys. I go, look, this guy named uh, D.A. Carson. Is that D.A. Carson called you? I'm like, yeah, who is that? He's like, he's like maybe the greatest theologian of our time. I'm like, well, he had invited me to this thing called the Gospel Coalition. You got invited to the Gospel Coalition? You? And I go, I know, I know. Shh, don't tell anyone. They, I said, he asked me to present a paper on, and I explained it. I, go, I wrote all the notes down. Okay, it's called da 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 I go, do you guys know what that is? They're like, yes, I know what that is. And one of them's like, I want to write a paper. I go, you want to? Okay, will you write it for me? <laughs> okay, Don, if you're here, I'm just laying it all out right now. No, Okay, here, I, I, this... I lied. I cheated. I'm 44 and I cheated on a test. Okay, I had someone else write my paper for me. And because of why, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to say, I don't know. I didn't want to say, you guys are over my head. I, I say, you know, my retention was never that good. And I, and I got through seminary and everything else. I, that's just me. I'm a liar. I, I want to fit in. I want to believe that I'm on that same level with you guys, that you're not beyond me. And, and, and so I get this paper, and, and, and I remember just going, okay, fine, I'm going to present it. And, and, and you get to the Gospel Coalition, and there's an inner circle, and there's an outer circle. And I was in the inner circle. I just want you to know that, okay? And, and you know, our junior associates are in the outside circle where all my buddies were. And, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, what's up? And... <laughs> And I read this paper that someone else wrote. And it was going fine until they started asking questions. <laughs> I didn't know there was question time. And, and some of the stuff in the paper was wrong. But what was I going to do? Say, I didn't write it. He did. <laughs> you know, I couldn't do it. And I just, you know, I, first one, I still remember. Uh, what's his face? Mark Driscoll asked me a question. And he used words I literally did not even under, I did not understand his question, and this time I couldn't even fake it. I just stared at him like, can you repeat that again? And he asked the question, and I just had to say, I I don't know how to answer it. And then Don Carson says, you know, in your presentation, I wish you had been more asymptotic. I was like, I, I thought about it. <laughs> so it was just this nightmare, okay? I was just village idiot, and I, I, I couldn't hide. Um, and the more I talked, the dumber I sounded, and I could just hear myself and my pride. Like, no, I fit in this room. I fit in this room. And uh, by the end of the conference, I, I went up to... Don Carson, and we've never even talked about this, so I, I, and I just said, you know, I, I don't think I fit here. And uh, he says, well, the leadership had a discussion, and we don't think you fit either, and it was like, it was a little awkward, it was like, okay, bye, um, just kind of went and left, and um, man, I just remember walking away again, and it's my pride, there was just this, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to study even harder, and I'm going to get there. And you just can't get there, okay? And and my fears started overtaking me. I start going, gosh, maybe I just shouldn't even teach. I don't match up. There's too many things I don't get. And, I, and, it, and it, it, it's all started in seminary where you study, 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 and you're just going, I don't get this. I'll pass the test, I'll get my grade, but there's no way I can keep up with these guys. And you just feel like you're the only person in the room that doesn't really get it. 
But your pride doesn't let you say that you don't get it. And then people challenge you through the years and you come up, you, you know, you jump on Logos and you try to find some facts for them and, and pretend you knew this all along and you just hide it, you fake it. Um, but it, it, it really put me in this spiral because you just start going, I don't know enough. I'm not equipped for this, God. I'm that workman that's just ashamed. I, I shouldn't be teaching. Um, it, it affected my courage. Then I started just feeling like, I don't know enough. Why should I ever open my mouth? You start getting insecure. You know, there's a big thing that's been happening the last few years, especially amongst younger people. People are getting depressed because of Facebook. You've heard of this, the Facebook depression. Because they'll go on Facebook and they'll see other people post these pictures of how happy they are. You know, and the most beautiful angles of them. You know, and oh, we had so much fun at this place. And people look on and go, I'm not having as much fun as her. I don't look like her. I don't have as many friends as her. And they're getting depressed because everyone's putting their best foot forward. And, 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 and everyone's just going, gosh, I don't match up to that. I'm not that person. And they just want to kill themselves. And, you, you know, we don't talk about this in the church. But I believe it happens in this very room. This type of envy. Uh, it, it may not be from Facebook, but it, it comes on the Internet. You go on the Internet and you see what other people are accomplishing in the name of God. And you just go, I'll never be able to pull off what that guy pulled off. You can go online right now, see all the things that Rick Warren is doing that you will never be able to do. You can go online right now and read everything that Tim Keller understands that you do. You will never understand. No fault to those guys. They're gifted, blessed in those ways. I'm just telling you, I've done it. And it's It's tough. And you get, uh, you start stressing yourself out. You get all insecure, you get anxious, and you just start trying to do more and measure up. And no one talks about this, but it's there. There's so much anxiety in this room right now of wanting to build a ministry, wanting to understand something, wanting to reach some plateau. And it goes against everything we've been reading I mean, what did we just study? I'm the, I'm the shepherd. You're a sheep. Just, just, just follow me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you lay down. I'm gonna have you have to drink. I'll protect you from your enemies. You don't have to fear anything. We go through the valley of shadow death. I got you. I got you. I got you. And then here's the sheep. Here we are, all stressed out. Somehow we're just stressed out about this, worried about this. We're anxious when he tells us, don't, don't you be anxious about anything. And then in John 15, he says, I'm the vine. Don't you get this? I'm the vine. I'm the true vine. You're, you're, you're the branches. You're the branches. In fact, he says, look, look, you don't even have to do anything. You're just a sheep. You're just a branch. All you got to do, all you got to do is stay connected to the vine. This is simple. Man, everything Jesus tells us, that this stuff is simple. I'm a sheep. Okay, I follow you. Okay, give me something to eat. Okay, take care of my enemies. Okay, that's all I got to do. I'm, I'm a branch. I just got to go, you know, let me just be connected to you. A branch doesn't go, oh, I'm going to make some fruit. No, he just, he's saying, dude, just stay connected to the vine. It automatically happens. And then God, my father, he's the vine dresser. He'll prune you. He'll make sure you are fruitful. It's a guarantee if, if I'm in you and you're in me. If you just abide in me, that's all I'm asking for. Simplify this. We overcomplicate things and stress ourselves out. And then we start deceiving and lying and pretending we're something. And Jesus is saying, well, you guys, would you rest? You're my sheep. I'm the vine. I'm the shepherd. You're a sheep. You're a branch. 
All you got to do is abide in me and you will bear fruit. And it's fruit that will last. It's a promise. And so Satan is going to come along and try to distract you from that. He knows if you just abide in him, stuff's going to happen. He's going to try to get you separated from the fruit. Jesus, I mean, separated from the vine. Jesus gives that illustration. It's it's the most pathetic, stupid picture. He goes, imagine a branch unattached to the vine, trying to produce fruit on its own. It was a ridiculous statement. There was probably a vine laying around. I go, just look at that. You, he can try all day. Nothing's going to happen. I promise you. All you have to do is be connected to him. And sometimes we can come to a conference like this and walk away even more insecure. Going, wow, I, I will never be able to communicate like him. I will never know as much as him. I will never have a strategy as good as hers. I will never do this like this. Da, 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 da. And what was supposed to encourage us actually got us leaving going, I'm stupid. I'm going to go be a plumber. You know? I mean, not that, you know, please. <laughs> Plumbers are awesome, okay? It, it, it just, you know what I'm saying. It, it's, that, oh man, I should have picked something else. You know, Jesus said, I, you know, one of the verses that, that was really sticking in my mind in that passage um, when I was studying this was in, in verse uh, 16 when he says, you didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. He says, you didn't choose me. I chose you and I appointed you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. The wording is very peculiar. I mean, he's saying, okay, I appointed you, I chose you, and, and, and here's what I chose you for. That you would go and bear fruit, like fruit that's going to last. So I, we can't mess this up. I mean, God picked us for this team, and he says, this is what I decided. I decided on you, and I decided that fruit was going to happen through you, because you were going to abide in me, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So the plan was that we would abide in Christ and we would ask him for fruit and God was going to answer that prayer. He goes, yeah, and I'm going to give you fruit because that's what I chose you for. It's going to happen. It's like this guarantee. I mean, there's this whole thing. It's it's like laid out for us. It feels like I don't really have to do a whole lot. Verse, verse, verse 4. Abide in me. And I and you, as a branch, cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine. You're the branches. Look, it's a promise. Whoever, whoever, that's you, that's me, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. That's it. He I chose you for this. What did, I, what did God choose us to He chose us to abide in Him. You just stay connected to me. It's going to happen. Fruit happens. You don't even have to work for it. Your enemies will be defeated by because I'm your shepherd. Just just lay down. I got this. Just stay attached to me. And yet our own pride, the messages from the world, the messages from even other believers can sometimes tear us apart from the vine and get us working and not trusting in that simple faith. That's why I love the story we heard from our brother from Cambodia. Just go, man, there I was in this concentration camp. I was in this prison camp and I just, and God just told me, it's, it's, I got you. I got you. 
This isn't the end for you. This isn't the end for you. I, I, let me give you dreams. Let me give you visions. Let me tell you what's going to happen. And then it happens, and he gets to see it, and, and we just sit back, and we don't, we don't praise him. We go, wow, God, you told him you did that. And, and, and I don't know how much, how smart he is. I, I, we've never talked. I, I, but I just assume, you know, here's a guy that's connected to the vine and all the branches. You know, he was a branch, and all this fruit came out, and we just sit, and we marvel, and we go, wow, that, that's, that's pretty simple. I'm just a sheep. I'm just a branch. I want to thank uh, some of you because some of you have come up and been so gracious to me during the last couple of days. And um, a couple of you might have been weirded out by my response even. Like you, you told me some very kind words about how some of the things I wrote or said had an impact in your life at a certain point. And I just look at you with like shock, like what? Wait, some I wrote? But you're at Smart People's Conference. Well, I, I, what? There's just this shock of, man, but, but you know what? I know that my life doesn't make sense. By any means, I was that weird kid. I wasn't brilliant. I wasn't popular. But I believed in this God. When I was young, man, I believed in him. I'd read those stories about, about David and Goliath and go, yeah, you know what? I could do that. I'd, I'd read about Daniel and the lion's den and go, yeah, I believe. And then you, the older you get, it's almost like the faith starts dying and dying and dying. And you get smarter, but you just feel like you know less. And you start depending on and striving and striving. And that childlike faith just slowly dissipates. Then every once in a while, someone comes up to you and says, you actually had an impact in my life. And you're just like, what? But I, who me? I'm not, I'm not smart enough. I'm not strategic enough. I'm not this, that, the other thing. And it's just, well, yeah, but you, you, you knew Jesus. I look at my life and I go, gosh, Lord, none of it makes sense. I couldn't have figured this out. It was just from knowing you and following your lead. And yet in my stupidity and in my pride, I want to take credit and pretend that it was because of how educated I am, how strategic I've been. And at the end of the day, no, I'm just a dumb sheep that happened to follow the shepherd I'm just a branch that happened to stay connected to the vine. See, this pressure uh, and expectations, they can kill you. I don't know what it's like in, uh, in Australia, but they've been doing all these surveys of pastors in the U.S. And about 60% of them admit that if they could find another job that would pay them an equal amount, they would quit today. Who wants to follow you think the world's looking on in that? Go, oh, I want to follow one of those guys who would quit tomorrow. We're, we're doing something wrong. And pastors are feeling insecure, feeling like they just don't measure up. And they're facing the same depression that the world does. And they don't have that life to where someone walks in and people can see through things. They see when we fake it. And I just, I don't know what it's like here. If there's people here that want to quit because the pressure is just too big and you just don't match up. My hero um, on this earth is a guy in, in India who's a pastor, who's a leader. He, really humble guy. If he was sitting in here, you'd, you wouldn't even know. He might be. Um, he's led about three million people to the Lord through his ministry, he plants, on average, 17 churches a day. Yeah, you're just kind of like, how is that possible? He, he's got over 50 colleges. And these are not like casual believers that prayed a prayer and said, I want Jesus to be my friend. These are people who literally, literally dig their graves sometimes before walking into a city to evangelize. Okay, there, there is some serious, serious following of Christ going on on this earth. 
We may not see it in some of our contexts. I'm just saying it's going on. But this guy is one of my heroes because he's just so simple, so humble, just so connected to the Lord. And he called me a couple months ago and he was crying. He's crying on the phone to me. And and was over another pastor in the U.S. of a big church, had another moral failure, and, and you know, it's just, he was crying, and I'm going, why is this guy crying? This happens every day. But he's weeping over it. It was not in any judgment or anything. He goes, I just don't get it. He goes, I talk to the pastors in your country. I talk to them, and and it just seems like they don't really know Jesus. Like, I walk away going, Lord, I wish he knew you. I wish he really knew you, Jesus. He goes, when they when they talk, he goes, they t- they know a lot about him, and they can tell me all these things about him. But it, it just feels like they talk they they talk about him like like an outsider, like an outsider looking in and observing him, rather having just been with him. And again, this was not in a judgmental attitude at all. It was in tears. He, and he made the statement. He goes, I feel like the people in your country are happy to hear from Moses when they can actually walk up the mountain themselves and meet with Almighty God, but they're not interested. They just want to hear from Moses. They want to hear from you, Francis. They want to take a selfie with Moses. Don't they realize they can come before the burning bush? Don't they realize they can walk up the mountain and it's just them and God? And don't they want to be connected to Him directly and know Him? And he's just crying. And I'm just listening to these words and going, wow. I think he's nailed it. Like sometimes we can get so into people, so into Moses. And not realize you can walk up that mountain yourself. And if we're not careful, we can get our sheep and we can get the people to come listen to us rather than teaching them. No, 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 this is no big deal. You got to go up the mountain. You have got to go up that mountain. My life and everything good in this life is because of those times I dared walk up that mountain and came in the presence of God and it was just me and Him and He spoke to me. He led me through His Word. I was abiding in Him and all this fruit came from it just these times I had with Jesus. That's where it was. And so now you, as you're one of my followers, look, just don't, don't, I've got to become less. Somehow I've got a decrease in your eyes, okay? And you've got to go up that mountain, trust me. You're not ever going to want to see me again. You'll just want to stay on that mountain with him and be connected to him because he's your shepherd. He's your vine. Just stay connected to him. Follow him. I've got to keep decreasing. I've got to keep decreasing. You go, 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 follow. That's why I told my staff and my church, I go, look, all of you leave, 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 leave. Quit being under me. There's something amazing when you just go off on your own and it's you and God. I was talking to another pastor from India and he he made this statement. I loved it. This was just like a month or two ago. He said, uh, he goes, I've been studying movements of God. And he says, you know how movements start? Movements of God start when the founder knows God. Jesus deeply. He goes, you know when movements die is when the followers only know the founder. (laughs) Wow, that's so good. And we live in a time where we want to attach ourselves to the founder of, of ministries. It's safe that way. I want to attach myself to this scholar. I want to attach myself to to this man who has a great ministry. I want to attach myself to this person. And it's not me just walking up that mountain and getting into the presence of God. And my question to you today is, man, when's the last time you seriously just walked up the mountain? And it was just you and him, and you were connected. You were abiding in that vine, because I'm telling you, that's when the fruit's going to come. Oh, you can make disciples without it, but the question is, is I, I mean, do we really want you making disciples? 
I mean, seriously, if you're not close to Jesus right now, why would we want two of you? Like, what, what are we reproducing? Stressed out sheep? Branches on their own trying to reproduce? Man, get connected again. Look, we can lose it. I'm just, I'm just laying it out. Look, I, I have grown in my walk with the Lord. I really have over the years. I have learned a lot of things. I believe I've grown in my wisdom. But I'm also realistic that while I've grown and been on this trajectory and I've been on this process of sanctification, there's also areas that I can look in my life where I've been declining, actually, such as my faith. And it hit me last year, Easter. Last year on Easter, I was, <clears throat> I was preaching at a new place. I was preaching at this place called the Hollywood Bowl to a congregation I'd never preached to before. And I was very excited because it was Easter and I thought, this is great. These guys have never heard me. I don't have to study. I can use an old message. You know, and so I went through all my Easter messages, which are your best ones. You know, so I looked through all my Easter messages and I got to reading some of the old ones. And as I read some of the things I said in the early days, I mean, yeah, there were those parts where I'm going, wow, that was wrong. You, you know, because your theology gets better. But, but there were some things I read in those early sermons where I go, I said that. That's really bold. I haven't said anything like that in a while. And you start realizing, I'm going, gosh, I remember, I can remember back, man, in some of those early days where I would get in front of a crowd and I didn't care what you thought about me. I cared about his holiness and I cared about his presence in the room. And I'm going, look, I don't care if everyone walks out, Lord. I'm saying it, I'm saying it. And I'm reading these things going, man, what happened to me? Was it all the criticism? And all the criticism, pretty soon as you're speaking, you're going, oh, I better say this right because I wonder who's going to email me back, who's going to get mad about how I say this just perfectly. And if I say this, oh, I'm going to get so many you know, emails, I won't have time, so let me say it like this. And, and you, you try, you tweak things, tweak things, tweak things because you're thinking about how people might respond. And then pretty soon you're not even a prophet anymore. You're just saying what you think will work rather than what he told you to say. And I'm reading this and I'm just going, God, what happened to me? I've gotten weaker. I don't want to get weaker. I I want to be more courageous as I get older. But the worst, okay, here's the worst part of it. I read this one sermon and this just sent me over an edge. I read this one sermon. It was a sermon of my son was born that week because I wrote out the whole story. Um, And my son is nine years old now. So how long ago was it? Good job. (laughs) Nine. Um, And... And I was describing it because I still remember we, you know, our our oldest daughter was uh, about about 10 years old and... um, and we're about ready to go to the hospital. And my wife's like, should we bring Rachel, our oldest daughter? And it's like, well, she's only like 10, you know. And we were debating it. Like, well, it might be good for her to see, you know. It might be too much. And then I just remember going, no, let's bring her. Let's bring her. If she sees childbirth, it'll keep her from messing around. You know. And uh, so we bring her along, right. And she's going to be there in the delivery room. And, and I remember the... When it came time for my son to be born, this, I already had three daughters, so this was my son. And there was something so cool about that moment. You know, like my son is coming out of the womb, and, and, and I love, love, love my daughters. I'm crazy about my daughters, but there was something different about the son as he was coming out. I'm just thinking, wow, we're going to hunt. We're going to, you know, kill stuff together. This is my, my man, you know. And, and, and I remember the doctor looked at my oldest daughter and says, would you like to deliver your little brother? And she's like... I can do that? And she's like, yeah. And, and she's okay. And she puts gloves on my little girl, puts a gown on her and little goggles. And she's there waiting for my son to come out. Again. And she's catching my son. Tears are coming down her face. She's just bawling, you know, just going, oh, 
oh, you know, and I'm as a dad filled with so much emotion, my son and my firstborn daughter, and I'm describing this whole story and just that moment and the emotions, and I'm reading this sermon that I wrote nine years ago, and at the end of it, it just said, as amazing as that was, it was nothing compared to my times with Jesus this week. I wish you could have been there, my intimacy with him. I just didn't want to leave him. It made the childbirth just pale in comparison. And I remember reading that and going, I remember that. I remember that. I remember just going, gosh, God, I can't believe this. I'm in your presence. It's you and me. I just don't want to leave. I don't want to leave. This is so good. And I remember the birth and everything. Everything pales. Everything is just, you know, grows strangely dim in that in that presence. And I'm reading it and I'm going... God, when's the last time I felt like that? This is what threw me over the edge. I realized I used to love Jesus more than I do right now. What the heck am I doing then? How did I get there? I didn't ever want to make a statement like that. But all the pressure, the insecurity, the lies of trying to match up to this person, that person, and to answer all of these people, and I just forgot to stay connected to him. And I heard these words from the Lord, from Revelation 3. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. Revelation 3, you know, you got this great reputation, but you're dead. But there's something that remains, you know, strengthen what remains and is about to die. I mean, I know some of you don't come from a more, uh, I don't know what you call a charismatic event where you hear from the Lord. And, 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 and so maybe I didn't hear from the Lord and just the verse popped in my head for some reason. Um <laughs> It doesn't matter. Either way, it's scripture, and we all agree on that. And, uh, but it was that phrase, strengthen what remains and is about to die. And actually, that was not a word of condemnation when I read it or heard it or thought about it. It was this word of encouragement from the Lord, from my shepherd. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. It, it was so encouraging to me because it was just God saying, you know what, Francis, it, it's still in there. I know you love me. I know you're my prophet. I know you'll say whatever I tell you to say. That's still in you. It's, it, it remains. Just just build it back up again. And Francis, I know you love me. I know there isn't anything on that earth you wouldn't give up for me. Just strengthen that side back up again. And the last year and a half has been just that for me. It's like getting back to that simple faith. And just getting in front of a crowd and going, look, okay, I'm not going to compete with you. I I don't I don't match up to some of you. I'll never know as much as you. But this isn't a competition. I need you. I need you to help me. I need you to fight for me and argue with some people for me because I can't argue with them. I need you in the body. And it, it'd be nice every once in a while if maybe you might say to someone who doesn't have your same gift that you need them also. And so you've got a completely different gift and there's just things you can... I, I remember that maybe the only time I ever heard that was from John Piper himself. I, I just, I loved it because he was like one of my heroes. I mean, he still is. But uh, he, I, I just, I, I was just like feeling dumb and going, gosh, I've read your books and I've tried to write like you. I've tried to, like one of your sentences, I got one, I think that is like one of yours. It took me all day though. And you you know, what do you think about this sentence? You know, and I go, I'm trying, I'm trying. And, And I just remember him looking at me and going, maybe you're not supposed to. I'm like, what? And he's like, I, I hear you're real good with the young people, and maybe this isn't your calling, and maybe you're supposed to just work with the youth and communicate to them in a way that they get it. And I was like, wow, 
oh, okay, I, I don't have to be like you. I, I always, because I, I always got this sense, like, no, I got to match up, I got to match up. And it was just like, no, you don't have to. You got your gift. I got my gift. There's no competition here. We need each other. Let's work together. I mean, the world's looking on, and we're just arguing about the dumbest things. The dumbest things. And some of us don't even know what we're saying when we argue. You know, we just read it somewhere in a book, and we're regurgitating it. And and it's like, come on, what are we doing? This is supposed to be simple. His yoke was supposed to be easy. His burden was supposed to be light. We're just supposed to be a bunch of sheep following the shepherd, just connected to the vine and fruits just coming out everywhere we go. And and it really is that. And I've just seen the more arrogant I get and the more I pretend I'm something I'm not, the less fruit that comes out of my life. And I just caught myself even before this service prayer. I've been praying so much, God. I, I miss the old Francis. I miss that stupid kid that just read the Bible, loved it, looked at his friends, loved them, tried his best to teach them about Jesus before I became Francis Chan, author, speaker, pastor. It's like, I miss Francis. And I think some of you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. There was that old you that was full of faith and you're still recovering from expectations and failures and trying to get back. And I'm going, let's just lay it all out on the table and let's just abide in him and let's get real with one another. Those of you who are brilliant scholars, I praise God for you. So grateful that I get to be a part of you and that we're in this thing together. And, um, and I hope you see value in some of the things that I do. Um, I'm funnier than you. I, you know, I, it's just, let's just lay it all out there. Um, we just, man, the world needs to see, like, this isn't a competition and we're not just a bunch of insecure people striving to be like one another. We're just a bunch of sheep so blown away and a bunch of branches all connected to the same vine. It's simple. Let's go back to the simplicity.